Welcome back everyone for a second roguelike tutorial. This time we're going to be exploring Specs. Specs is an amazing entity component system library. It does a whole bunch of great stuff for you and we're going to be integrating it with the roguelike graphics that we did last time. Hello and welcome to You Code Things. So we start as always with making a new project. This time we're using TSOD, but also we're using a little library called Specs, and they take quite a bit of time to download. We're gonna start exactly how we did last time. We're not gonna use Specs yet, we're just gonna get a root canvas up, and we're going to pick a font, and we're going to pick a foreground color, and we're going to do all the things to get this glyph on the screen right here. We know this. Now we also want to move this character around. So we've made this mutable X and Y variable and we're adding one. And now when we run it, we can see this glyph move across the screen. Make sure to always flush so that you can see the result. We also want to clear the canvas so that we can be rubbing out the ones behind. And now we've got this illusion of movement of this character moving in a diagonal. Now this is kind of what we did, we kind of grew from this model last time kind of insanely. Like we then put the variables in an object and the object got more properties and more properties and more properties and it just got crazy. So instead we're going to use the entity component system this time. So we're going to bring in the specs world. Now the world is going to be the game holding the entities. This code, this kind of loop is going to go into a system. It's going to vanish and everything else is also going to go in a system. Initiate a new world with world new. And now we can create a component. We're gonna start with a position component. So this is gonna be our X and Y properties. And we wanna make sure we can do equality on this position component. Now in specs, we also have to say what kind of storage the component is going to be. There's various forms of storage, but we're gonna use the kind of default easy one. We have to make sure to implement component for our structs. This component is our position. So the storage that we're giving it is vec storage. There's a link below and the specs documentation goes much further into the different storage options. Now we can create a system. So we're creating a printing system, kind of a very simple system to get us started. This printing system, it's going to read the storage that we put our positions in. So we, we write read storage position and now this system has access to this position. Now your systems have a run method, which take a mutable reference to themselves and to the system data. Now we can do a join. The join method is very cool because the join method is how you take all these kind of separate pieces of components and you put them all together. Here we're iterating over all entities with the position component and we can print these positions. Now we need a little bit more work done to be able to dispatch this system. We can create a dispatch builder, add the printing system, name it print sys, and we build it. And then we set it up with the world resource and finally create an entity. So this is an entity with a position of X10 and Y10. Now when we run this dispatcher, we, we can dispatch the dispatcher on the world and it's going to run our program. It's gonna run all the systems on the entities in the world. And so there's our print. That's that one entity with the one component, but we can copy paste this entity a bunch of times and now we have lots of prints. Uh, but this isn't that interesting. We wanna be doing combinations. So if we have a print me tag, this has got the null storage, which means it has no data, it takes no memory. And this can be used kind of to do joins of components. Essentially, we can now say, we only want to do logic on the join of position and this print me tag. We can add a print me tag onto this entity. Now we can change our join to look for position and print me. This is in a tuple. You can have a huge amount of components here. And now the system only runs for that one single entity with those two components. We can also use a not. So when exclamation mark says not, so now we're looking for positions and not print me tags and we get the other three. Copy this and we paste it and we make a not printing system. This is just a, a separate system for us, but this not print me system is going to be going over the not print me tags. If we add it now to the dispatcher, these two systems will automatically run in parallel if they don't depend on each other. And you'll see this here when there's no separation, they're both running at the same time. 
but we can make the second one depend on the princess by adding the princess name to that array. We can see there's a logical grouping. The first system runs, and then the second system runs. So this is kind of, this is kind of everything you really need to know. So we're gonna add a character glyph. This is so we can actually draw a character. And now we need a render system. Now the slight difference here is we're gonna actually pass the ownership of that root canvas that we draw on into the render system. This means that the ownership of that root canvas is no longer gonna be outside in our main function. It's gonna be only in this system. We need kind of a lot of stuff for this system, but then we basically just copy it all in and do a join over the glyphs and the positions. And then we just draw the glyph on position X, position Y, and then wait for key press. Never forget to add that system. So we're using with thread local, a special kind of system addition. This makes sure we run this, this specific system separate to everything else in a single thread. But nothing appears yet, and that's because we haven't actually added our glyphs. If we add our character glyphs to these entities, suddenly they all appear. That's pretty neat. Now, kinda, kinda a problem here because we can't actually have a game loop because now this loop doesn't work because root has been passed into the system. Luckily, there's a global resource sort of thing in specs. We can make a game state. We add this resource game state to the world. Now, instead of looping and kind of, and trying to read root, we're going to instead loop and look at our resource to find out if we're gonna end the game. We take the game state out of the world by using the read resource method. And then we can just check if the game state is end, break. Now we're just doing a little bit of renaming to TSOD system here, just to make this video a little bit more confusing for you. Now we can add write game state to this system. So this is allowing the, the render system to write the game state. And that means we can now just do game state dot end equals root dot window closed. And so that's going to basically check that window closed and pass it out into that loop. And now we can close the window. Magic. We're adding this player control tag, the same as we did to the print tag. We're adding some handle key press logic and we're mutating this, the keys onto the game state. Now we can make a player move system that writes the position. So it uses write storage because we're writing onto a component and it's reading storage, it's reading from the player controller component. What this means is we can check if there's a key press, we want to iterate over all entities with the component position and player controlled, and then we want to mutate their positions. Make sure to add that player move system to the dispatcher. And now with the addition of the player controller, we have a moving character. But what's really impressive is that with very minimal effort, we can say not player controlled and suddenly we can control everything else. This is very interesting because you can add and remove components within the system. But that's all we have time for this time. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Smash like and subscribe. 